There we go with the recording. I want to give special thanks to our sponsors who've made things happen. Iron USA, Brain Pop, Black Classroom Project, A Little Lies, Big Dreams, Blackboard Collaborate, and Tech Smith. Thank you for helping us put this extravaganza on. The next thing I want to do is I'm going to give everybody whiteboard privileges and you'll be able to tell us where you are in the world. So I'm going to do that right now. And you'll see some tools on the left-hand side of the, of the whiteboard. Click on the one that's a star. If you've been in other sessions, you know what to do. And indicate where you are in the world so we can get an idea of how global we really are today. And there I see the people down in Mozambique. Very exciting. And we know the other half of the world is probably asleep right now. So um, this is just, this really kind of, this mapping activity that we do with every session really kind of brings everything together um, in terms of why we're here and really celebrates the spirit of this conference. So uh, in the chat, you can also indicate where you're from. I'm in Chicago, Illinois, in the middle of the United States. And uh, you can add that to the chat box as well. With that, I'm going to turn this over to Andrew and Howard. And Dr. Gardner, thank you again for coming. And Andrew, uh, you guys, I'm very excited to hear you speak. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Lucy. Um, <clears throat> Dad, you may want to turn on your mic, press the little button that says talk, and just make sure that I can hear you. Testing, can you hear me? We hear you. I hear you, no, no problem. Um, I'm hopeful that everyone else can as well. Um, well, Lucy, thanks for the uh, intro. I do remember vividly the day that you came to uh, the School of Columbia when at that time I was a, um, I was a, I was just beginning as a technology teacher. Um, I had moved from first grade and, uh, you know, Lucy has been um, a wonderful friend for many years, um, helping, you know, almost a mentor I'd say, um, helping guide me and give me advice and um, really just been a wonderful person and is a real exemplar for, for, for a DIY person. She just gets so much done. Um, so I was thrilled to be a brain pop and be able to uh, help um, us support the uh, Global Education Conference this year. So um, thanks, Lucy. Uh, and Dad, it's, it's, we've never really done this before. We've pr had many conversations around the table um, about education and about technology, but now we're doing it for a public audience. So um, yeah, it's historic and, and fun. I think a couple of years ago, we were at Kane University, and they videotaped us, but I'm not sure if anything ever happened. Did you ever hear about that, Dad? No. Um, I'm in the dark. No. All right. Here. Well, <laughs> nonetheless. Um, so, so I think I'm going to sort of hop right in. Um, a lot of people, when I was growing up, said, oh, Howard Gardner is your father. It must have been so amazing to grow up, and he must have really valued you know, all your creative output and this and that. And I often say, yeah, that was the case, but he really valued hard work over everything. <laughs> um, and I mean, Dad, you really pushed me hard to, to practice piano and to work on really the core academics. Um, very, very seriously. But um, the reason I mention that is because when many people first hear the concept of, of multiple intelligences, which is what you're most well known for, I, it often seems to be pushed together with the concept of learning style. And so I want you to take this opportunity to sort of help clarify what's the distinction between a learning style and multiple intelligences, because it seems to be um, something that's often confused. And you've corrected me in the past, and I think it's important to clarify that. And th that's all I really want to talk about MI, because I know there's a lot of other stuff that's more um, connected to what we're, we're, we're at the global conference for. So tell us a little bit about um, the difference between learning styles and multiple intelligence. It's important to understand that the theory of multiple intelligences was not initially an educational theory. It was a theory of how the brain and the mind are organized and how they develop. And I listed, as most people know, uh, several different intelligences. And the basic claim was that you could be smart in some things and it doesn't have any predictive value about how you would be in other things. Psychology has always had a... Dad, can I pause you for, for one second? Because <coughs> people are having trouble hearing you. Um, just either speak a little louder or go a little closer to your microphone. Is this better? Yeah, that's more clear. Thanks. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, I was more as surprised as any that the initial interest in MI theory was much more from educators than it was from people in psychology. 
And so for quite a while, I simply observed how people made use of the ideas in education without promoting anything myself. Um, but what I noticed was that people were assimilating it, the idea of multiple intelligence, to an earlier concept in education, learning styles. Now, I have nothing against the term learning styles, but it's a very different concept from the term of an intelligence. An intelligence is simply a, um, a mental computer that we have. And if your linguistic computer works very well, you learn languages easily, you talk very fluently, we say you have high linguistic intelligence. If your interpersonal computer is not very good, you don't pick up clues from other people, you're not very good at understanding what people are driving at, then we say you have a mediocre or poor uh, interpersonal intelligence because the computer is, is sluggish. Learning style is an assertion about how you approach many different things. If you're planful, so to speak, you have a planful style, um, that means you, pl you approach everything in a planful kind of way. If you are you know, jocular or reflective or impulsive, the notion is that you approach things across the board in those ways. Um, one aspect of a style is that you approach many things in the same way. That's not particularly characteristic of MI. The fact that I may be unlinguistic doesn't mean that I approach everything through language. I may or may not. I may want to work in areas that I'm not very good, and that's fine. The other thing, which frankly, Andrew, grates me more, is when people talk about an auditory or visual or a tactile or kinesthetic style. I think that's a, a nonsensical concept. Um, uh, often when um, people are not um, good at reading, but are good at, let's say, drawing, people will say that person has got a visual style. But of course, reading is visual too. So I don't think it's a coherent concept. You'll note when we talk about my intelligences, the intelligences don't talk about which sensory system is used. They talk about what happens to the material when it gets inside. So my linguistic intelligence works whether I'm speaking or listening or reading or if I'm blind. Um, I use Braille, which is a tactile medium. So that's probably all we should say about learning style. But I do implore people who have interest in MI or learning style not to conflate the two because it raises my blood pressure and that's not to be recommended. Right. Um, well, I'm, I'm really glad you got the opportunity to, to say that because I know it's something that bugs you. And you know, even um, in, in some graduate schools of education, they do get uh, blended because the distinction is um, is, uh, it exists, but it, you know, because there are these different approaches to understanding, and then there's the computer that aligns often with the approaches, people um, mix them up. So with that said, what's one of the worst ways that you've seen people use the concept of MI um, in education, um, or, or how do you feel it's been abused? Because of course, there's people that understand it and bring it in in really um, effective ways. I'm sure there's people that do um, Let's go to job, and I'm curious about what, when you've seen it used best and when you've seen it used worst. And then we'll finish MI. <laughs> yeah, I have a very vivid image of when it is used worse. In 1993, I got a message from a colleague in Australia. I think I was already doing email then, but um, I certainly didn't know how to load, how to download attachments if they even existed. And he said, you're not going to like the way MI theory is used in Australia. So I said, well, send me some evidence. And he mailed me a stack of papers which literally were, was a foot high. And I remember standing in my office leafing through these papers. And the more I looked, the angrier I got. And when I finally saw a table, this was in Australia, of all the different racial and ethnic groups in that country, including aboriginals, and which intelligences they had and which ones they lacked, I just hit the scene and I said, this is nuts. It's completely non-scientific. It's nonsense. It's stereotypical and it will only cause trouble. So I actually went on television in Australia, this was uh, almost 20 years ago, and I denounced this educational intervention, which may have been well-intentioned, but it, it just uh, gave me the willies. And very happily, they stopped uh, doing that. But even today, people very well-meaning, I was just in a country that um, shall remain nameless, and people said, well, shouldn't we really teach the people of one skin color or one ethnicity differently than the way we teach others. And I said, no, 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 no. Uh, that, that's not a, an important distinction. So that's what really got me upset the most. And probably 
it actually shifted me from being mostly a connoisseur of what people had done with the idea to being somebody who's more interventionist in the sense of saying, you, know, you really shouldn't, you really shouldn't do this. Now, the, on the issue of what makes me feel the best, it's frankly when people create materials or classrooms or museums which actually invite people to make use of different intelligences and not only do people learn <coughs> what sorts of intelligences are strong, but um, they also learn that not everybody uh, is better than in them in everything and not everybody is worse, that people have very distinctive profiles. And here you're going to have a kind of flashbulb memory. This is much more recent. In 2005, I was told that there was a new theme park in Denmark that was opening up and they had used my ideas. Would I come to the inauguration of this park? And I, I couldn't come, but I was in Scandinavia sometime later and I said, could I come and visit? And they said, sure. And this turns out to be called the Explorama at Danfoss Universe in southwestern Denmark. If people look at my books, they can learn about it. But basically, this is a set of 30, 40, 50 different games or exercises, each of which, by argument, makes use of a different intelligence or set of intelligences. And anybody who spends a morning or an afternoon in the Explorama will learn a great deal about how their mind works and how other people's mind works. And my one contribution was they didn't have a measure of intra-personal intelligence, understanding yourself. So I worked with them to create a little personal assistant. And when you go to the Explorama, you can actually predict how you're going to do in various of these games and uh, exercises. And then after you've spent time there, you can actually look and see whether your predictions were right. And that's an interesting measure of your interpersonal intelligence. How well do you know your own mind? So when people do imaginative things having to do with curriculum or assessment or pedagogy, drawing on the ideas, that makes me very happy. Cause as you, the audience has already learned, I'm more of a professor and thinker than I am somebody who works actively in museums or in schools for young kids. So it's up to other people really to make the applications. <coughs> Terrific. Um, and it's interesting to hear how the people at Danfoss um, really thought of it from um, from. And I see that Lucy has already given us a URL, so anybody who wants so to visit nice there to can go really do so. It. Thank you, Lucy. Um, Matt, I'm very impressed that you're following the chat as, uh, <laughs> as you're speaking. Sometimes that kind of uh, task switching can be challenging for us. Um, so to move on a little bit from MI, even though there's lots of um, peppers of cool comments in the chat box, um, by the way, we'll get back to some questions at the end of the session. Um, I want to move on a little bit to um, Project Zero. And um, a lot of people may not know about Project Zero. And I know about Project Zero because as um, growing up as your son, when I was little, um, I used to go into Project Zero, which is um, dad's research group in, um, at Harvard. And they'd do little experiments with me, um, pop me in front of a computer and have me type or have me do some musical work or this and that, and they paid me $3. And I was psyched because Project Zero paid me $3 back in 1981. Um, but a lot of people that are listening today may not know so much about Project Zero. And I know that your theory of MI came out of the work that you've done at PZ, as well as a lot of the work that you did at uh, the Vet Veterans Administration in the late 70s. Um, but tell us a little bit about Project Zero and um, some, some of the projects that, that, you've, that you've done there. Um, and particularly because this is a global education conference, some of the stuff that's been coming out about um, about uh, ethics and and um, Do you have sort a couple of hours, Andrew? So, can you tell us a little bit about that? <laughs> okay. Um. <laughs> okay. Uh, no, <laughs> we got we got about ten minutes, and then we're going to move on good. to uh, some information so, first about of all, good work. But, uh, so we're going is to the main of a um, research but, uh, organization at Harvard, though it has tentacles in many other places. It was started in 1967. A colleague of mine named David Perkins and I were founding members. And we're still with Project Zero, so we've been there for 44 years, quite a bit longer than you've been on this planet, Andrew. And um, for 28 years, David and I were the co-directors of Project Zero. It was started by a 
distinguished philosopher Nelson Goodman, and now we've had um, two other leaders um, since. Um, Shari Tishman is the currently current leader of Project Zero. The name is worth explaining. It was originally begun with an interest in the area of arts education, and Nelson Goodman, the founding director, said, well, you know, we know lots of stuff about art education, but we don't have systematic knowledge about how to help people become good poets or good artists or how to, how to um, recognize style in, in literary or musical works. We don't really know much about the nature of metaphor and how to teach people um, to understand and appreciate metaphors. So he said, let's call this Project Zero and let's do some real studies of arts education. Now, 44 years later, Project Zero is a holding company for the research of about 12 what are called principal investigators. These are people with doctoral degrees who have permission to apply for grants from foundations or from the government. And we each do research. All the research has something to do with education. I like to say that at Project Zero, we develop ideas about education and give them a push in the right direction. As I've already said, you know, we're not basically people who run schools or museums or um, not non-government organizations, but we develop ideas like the theory of multiple intelligence, and then we help people make use of it educationally. And Project Zero's major um, survival achievement is we could exist existed for almost half a century on soft money. That means Harvard gives us a home, but they don't give us any money. In fact, they take overhead. Um, and so all the work at Project Zero, and there have literally been hundreds of grants and hundreds of people who have worked there in the last half century, has to fit two requirements. Number one, we have to want to do it. And number two, we have to be able to get money to do it. Um, and we don't go after money unless there's something we really want to do. That's what's, what's unusual. Now, my own work has been chiefly about um, arts knowledge, how artistic knowledge develops in kids, about multiple intelligences and the different kinds of capacities that human beings have and how they develop them, education for understanding what it means not just to know facts and information, but to be really be able to unpack a concept and apply it properly. And then as you were indicating, more recently it's been in the area of ethics, what we call good work, good play, good collaboration, and so on. And I have a wonderful group of colleagues, um, people who helped me do this research. They are graduate students, they are people just out of college, and then there are seasoned investigators. Two of my um, colleagues who are managers with me have been working with me for 15 years, Wendy Fishman and Lynn Berenson, and Carrie James and Katie Davis, lesser periods of time, but also are terrific managers. And we go out and um, get money to do research and what we want to do research on. So that's a the general picture. Um, every summer we run institutes, and these institutes are quite remarkable. Um, we have people from 20 or 30 countries, from 20 or 30 states, from all over the globe, and people come and spend, in the case of one institute, a week, in the case of other institute, five days, studying things like how, what does it mean to understand, how do you apply the theory of multiple intelligences, what kinds of minds do we need in the future? How is education changing? And at the Project Zero classroom, we actually have 90 people who are on the faculty. So we bring a huge number of experts to, to talk about these things. I would say that Project Zero is probably better known in education outside of America than it is um, within the country. We could talk about that. And actually, one of the questions, Andrew, that you said you were going to ask me, and you, it's probably on your list, is about disappointments. And I've been disappointed that there aren't more people in the United States who understand what we're trying to do and who make use of it. And I think, speaking frankly, it's because the pressures of No Child Left Behind and of standardized testing and of uh, annual year progress and of people getting uh, fired, or if schools getting closed down, if they don't make enough progress, um, has narrowed the purview of many, many teachers and superintendents and principals and made them less open to some of the things that Project Zero looks at, like art, ethics, deeper understanding, and so on. So that's a disappointment to me. But happily, 
in many other countries in the rest of the world, there's enormous interest in these ideas. And you know, the world's a pretty big place. We're happy if there's interest in Italy or Brazil or Singapore. We, we, we've gone to all those places. Andrew and I, by the way, will be traveling with our wives to India in January. And we will be there in part to visit a country we've not been to before, but in par part wearing our educational hats. We'll be going to Delhi, Mumbai, Chennai, um, 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 Bangalore, and Hyderabad. And we'll be carrying the Project Zero banner and the uh, Brain Pop banner and other, b other banners as well. Yeah, we're, we're, I'm very excited for that, um, for sure. Um, so you gave us a pretty good overview of a lot of different ways that PZ, has, which is Project Zero for short, um, is making inroads in, in education. And, and you know, you've expressed your disappointment in how um, it has not been fully embraced within the US. And you've also identified the uh, political pressures that make that hard for people. Um, but I want to go into some of the work that you've been working, some of the work that's, that you've been doing more recently, which is you know, through PZ. And that is the work with uh, the Good Work Project. And back in, uh, I think it was in, was it in 2004 that Good Work came out? Is that correct? Um, much older than well, that, Andrew. Yeah, that was uh, earlier. The, uh, yeah, 94? <laughs> but why don't I just talk a bit about it? In, in 1994-95, <laughs> um, I was with two very valued colleagues, Bill Damon, who's an expert in moral development, uh, in a sense of purpose of kids, and Mike Csikszentmihalyi, who's known all over the world for his work on flow. Um, I'll actually say his name again, because that's one thing you can all take away from here, is the man who created the notion of flow is Mihai Csikszentmihalyi. It's uh, not easy to spell <laughs> or to pronounce. And this was um, you know, a long time ago. It was almost 20 years ago. We were in California for the year. And we were observing uh, a very disturbing a trend in the United States, namely that people thought that everything in the world should be controlled just by market forces. Everything should be an issue of supply and demand. And if there's no demand, it, people should go out of business. And if there's uh, too much supply, that's not good either. And we're beneficiaries of the markets. We're not um, total critics of markets. But we believed if you take a look at the professional landscape, it would be extremely dangerous to everything controlled by market forces. Let's take journalism. Journalism should help people know what's going on in the world. Um, but if people only want to have gossip or pornography, is that sufficient reason for newspapers and you know, broadcast, news broadcast outlets to exist? Um, we want lawyers to um, be fair to us, but also have a sense of justice. But what happens if all the lawyers are just working for corporations and doing whatever the, the board or the stockholders wants? Um, in the area of medicine, if everything is owned by huge health maintenance organizations and doctors are told which patients they could see and which um, drugs they can prescribe and which ones they can't, uh, that's not good either. And of course, in the area of education, um, the more education becomes privatized, the more people um, are working for a uh, for-profit corporation with great incentives to cook the books, so to speak, and very little incentive to teach things like the arts or humanities, because those don't have the same market value, then education basically becomes a business. So we were interested in the, the public dimension of professions, what I call the disinterested. Disinterested means not uninterested but rather trying to do the right thing for society, not just for whoever pays you the most. And so we started something called the Good Work Project. And over the next five years, we interviewed over 1,200 people in nine different professions, including both pre-collegiate and higher education, but also law, medicine, journalism, um, genetics, and so on. And we tried to understand what good work was in the United States and how people thought about it and whom they admired and why and what they did to try to achieve good work. Um, very, very um, succinctly, good work is composed of three elements, three strands, each begin with the letter E. It's technically excellent. 
it's it's personally engaging, and it's carried out in an ethical way. So let's take good work in teaching. A good worker in teaching knows his or her stuff, is excellent, technically knows the material, cares, you know, isn't burnt out, doesn't wait till Friday, but really wants to come to school and help the kids, and carries out the work in an ethical way. I mean, you know, you could uh, simply direct all your attention to the child whose parents give you lots of money, right? Or you could do whatever your boss tells you, even you think it's bad for um, the kids. Those would not be ethical ways of behaving. And every profession has lots of ethical dilemmas. It's not clear if you have two problem kids in the class and 28 other kids, how much time should you spend with those two problem kids and how much time with the other 28 kids. It's not clear if the state puts in a, an exam, which you think is a lousy exam, whether you can just say, well, the hell with it, forget the exam, or whether you have an obligation to prepare kids for it. So those are the kind of ethical dilemmas that arise in education. So the, the Good Work Project has been very productive. We've written many books and articles. We've created something called the Good Work Toolkit. Um, and it's a increasingly visited um, website which has Twitter and Facebook um, capabilities, a lot of blogging. I, I'm on it every day and uh, put my two cents in. And the, uh, the Good Work Toolkit is, again, at least as well known in other countries as it is in the United States. Wendy and Lynn, my colleagues, just spent a week in India doing Good Work Toolkit with, this, with a string of 40 or 60 schools, which are not just in India, but in Sri Lanka, and I think Ireland, and spread out the former British Empire. So the Good Work Toolkit is a very useful tool that comes out of our Good Work work. Full stop. Um, many of you know about the MacArthur Foundation in Chicago. They've been extremely interested in how kids are changed by the new digital media. And about 2005, I was talking to the then head of the foundation, Jonathan Fanton, he says, he's, he said, we're very interested in whether kids are really different because of the digital media. You know, do they have different kinds of personality? Um, do they learn differently? Do they collaborate differently? And we're starting a very large project. I think it's $100 million to try to understand this. And without any particular uh, st strategic um, motivation, I said, Jonathan, are you, are you thinking at all about their ethics, about what are the ethics of the new digital media, which even then I understood was kind of a wild west. You know, there are really very few rules on the internet except the web, ones that people make up themselves. There's no cop, there's no law, there's no constitution, there's no um, Congress or anything. And he said, no, come to think of it, we haven't really thought about these ethical issues. So over the next months with Carrie James and other colleagues, we created something we call the Good Play Project. And for the last five years, we've been studying what happens to a number of um, important human dimensions with young people in the new digital media. I'll just mention the five. What does it mean to have a sense of identity in a world where you can create all kinds of avatars and you can create fictitious um, entries on Twitter or Facebook? What happens to a sense of privacy when almost anything about you can be um, spread anywhere and you never know for sure that it's been deleted? Ownership, authorship, this is the thing that educators are most concerned about, plagiarism, passing off work of others as if it were your own, not crediting um, sources properly. But you know, when you go to Wikipedia, what's the source? It's Wikipedia, but where does it come from? You don't know. Um, trustworthiness and credibility. How do you establish your own trustworthiness, your own credibility? Um, uh, and how do you determine whether somebody you're in digital con contact with is, is, is trustworthy? And finally, and, and this is probably the most important point to people who haven't thought a lot about this, what, is it, what does it mean in the digital era to participate in a community? For almost all of human history, people have basically just lived in the neighborhood. And they've dealt with 100 or 150 people who are on the block, so to speak. And if you hit somebody, they're going to hit you. <laughs> and if you steal from somebody, they can steal from you, or they can ostracize you. But almost all of our morality, what I call neighborly morality, 
is with the people whom you hang around with all the time. Once you get into the digital universe, into cyberspace, you never know for sure who's going to come in contact with you, what use they're going to make of it. Um, you know, you, you, whether you're joining a multi-user game or whether you're posting something on Facebook or whether you're um, buying or selling something on, on eBay, um, this information you can never know for sure the extent it will last and where it will go. And what it means to participate in a virtual community is not something anybody had to deal with until literally Andrew's lifetime. So that's what the Good Play Project is about. And we've, are, we've been working quite closely with two organizations. One is called Common Sense Media, known to many parents and teachers. And they have created a adult-friendly um, curriculum based on these five spheres that I've described. And then we also work with an organization called New Media Literacies. Many of you will know the work of Henry Jenkins, once at MIT, now at University of Southern California. And we created a quite ambitious um, ethical guidebook called Our Space. Our Space. And if you go to the Good Work website, or you go to the MacArthur website, or you go to Henry Jenkins' New Media Literacies, now at Southern California website, you can look at the Our Space curriculum. It's downloadable, you know, uh, and you're, you're welcome to make use of it. In fact, we're very interested to know about the uses that people do make of it. And you know, Pew comes out with a report, 75% of kids, this is last week, report cyberbullying. What do you do about that? Those are ethical questions. Are you a bystander? Do you stand up? Do you report? Um, and these are not issues people have thought about very much before. So the Good Play Project has been addressing that set of issues. So Dad, do you have any examples of um, uh, uh, Curriculum that the Good Play, if Good Play work, uh, pardon me, if the Good Play project has has come up with any curriculum suggestions for teachers around how to build um, work, you know, around identity and ownership, authorship, and trustworthiness, and and community. And of course, you're saying well, we, we you've worked with about common sense. Um, yeah. But you know, well, we were talking yesterday about two of the of the materials we work with. One is. Um, a student posts a very nasty um, post about his teacher, um, you know, Mr. Mr. Gibbons is an awful person and I hate him. Uh, if you get this message and you're in the class, what do you do about it? Um, then we were talking about another dilemma where uh, a member of the class makes a very um, racist comment um, about people from another race. And uh, this gets, of course, goes viral. And the kind of thing we discuss with young people is, you know, what's your, what would you do if this happened? Um, who would you be concerned about? How active would you be? Um, and then in our research, Andrew, we compare younger with older people. We compare girls with boys. And then we also interview parents and teachers. Because um, one of the things which won't surprise you is that often parents and teachers do not have any more sophisticated understanding of the implications of actions like that than, than young people do. There's very little, very little mentoring in the, uh, in the cyber world because young people are digital natives. They've had more experience dealing with you know, social networks and with uh, uh, blogs and, and multi-user games than, than ancients like me. Um, and the ancients like me may have more general moral or ethical guidelines, but we don't really understand you know, what it means to, you know, to have a, a, a Facebook site where you're um, posting photographs of people without their permission and it gets, gets passed on and so on. What we do in the Our Space um, curriculum is we have sections there for teachers suggesting how they make use of the kinds of dilemmas I've just described. Some of them are very vivid. You know, they have very interesting uh, either illustrations or actually YouTube uh, sections people can look at. How to guide the discussion. Probably the most technical thing is around the, er the area of, of copyright. You know, copyright is a technical issue. What can you download? What can you circulate? What do you owe to the person who created the material? Um, and we found, uh, this hasn't been published yet, that um, every child will tell you 
that copywriting, that, that, that copying stuff is wrong, but then they will go on to tell you under what conditions they do it and why. And it's because everybody does it, you know, or, you know, those, those rock groups make, a, make enough money anyway, or um, people must want to do it because they post it and that's an implication that you really should circulate it. And we're trying to understand the thinking around these issues because most we understand how young people or not so young people think about issues like privacy, copyright, trustworthiness, and so on, there's no chance that one can have an effective um, curriculum. And our space is pretty new, but we're happy to say that um, people are beginning to use it and ask questions about it. And in fact, uh, I just learned in the last hour we're going to be putting on a Good Work, Good Play um, Institute in a couple of years where people will come to learn how to use those materials. And my colleagues, Wendy Fishman, Lynn Berenson, um, Katie Davis and uh, Carrie James are already giving workshops in, in not not just in India but in, in many in many places on how to use these materials. So I think this is this is something that's going to be very useful to everybody in the digital era is how to deal with these vexed ethical issues which arise all the time. Well, it also makes me think about I mean how people perceive themselves even before digital media. Um, I mean, I'll actually use a digital media. Yeah, yeah, Andrew, I'm going to have to stop um, for a second because there's a, I think I a lot of noise the, outside uh, and I have to go and shut it off. I love this, Andrew. This is going so well. Really, I'm enjoying hearing your dad talk. And, you know, one of the things I wanted to say, too, before was uh, when Steve interviewed him about a month or so ago for, for Future of Education, I just thought his observations about uh, education were really important because he has perspective from his travels and, and working with very high-level people. So this is great, and hopefully he's back right now. Yes, I'm back. Thank you. Um, they didn't stop the noise, right. but we made it. We made it very loud, so I can hear you. Very <laughs> loud. Okay. You so you're all right. You can hear me all right. Yes, excellent. You can hear me okay. Yes, I can. Can okay. you hear me? So it makes me think that even. Yes. Yes. Even before digital media, there's, there's a large gap between how people perceive themselves and what they actually do. Like, for example, you want to go see a movie at the theater, and you think, oh, I should go see this, uh, this Francis Ford Coppola movie, which is very um, engaging and highbrow. But then when you get there, you actually end up going to see something that's kind of lowbrow and stupid, because you actually just want to be entertained. You may not want to be challenged as much mentally. So I see that there's always a, a there's often been a disconnect between how we perceive ourselves and what we actually do want. And so I wonder when you're saying, oh, kids say they shouldn't copy, but then they go ahead and they do. I wonder if that's actually a phenomenon that existed prior to um, digital media as well. It may not have been as easy to do as it is with new digital media. Yeah. But do you think that existed before? I, I think you're right. Um, we published a book um, in 2004 called Making Good. The Good Work book was some years earlier. And in that book, uh, Wendy Fishman and I said, we quoted Alan Greenspan, who was then the head of the Federal Reserve. He said, people have always been greedy, but it's never been so many ways to be greedy. And I think there's always been a, uh, you know, a temptation to copy. But as you yourself said, it's so easy to do now, and chances are if you copy, you won't get caught. And to be blunt about it, if you get caught, probably nothing will happen to you because people are very phobic about suits and other kinds of legal things. And so I think that um, a tendency which was always there uh, is one that's been exacerbated so badly that every place you go, including Harvard faculty, you find people pushing off work of others as their own. And, you know, there are some people who say, well, it's always, it was always that way. Shakespeare used um, plots of other people without credit. But I think that's completely wrong. Um, I think the core of the, area of, the, of, the, of the profession of education is to develop your own ideas and when you use other ideas to give people credit. And once that goes away, then, you know, the whole point of an education profession is gone. I don't know whether you intended this or not, Andrew, but we're getting to the subject of my most recent book, Truth, Beauty, and Goodness Reframed. And what I'm trying to do in that book is to think about these classical virtues of truth, beauty, and goodness in terms of philosophical critiques on the one hand and technological threats 
on the other. And with reference to what we're talking about, copying and cheating and so on, um, you know, a philosophical critique would be, well, nothing is ever completely original, so it doesn't matter if you uh, pass on other work as your own. Um, and the technological one, which is what we've been talking about, is it's so easy now to transmit stuff, and it's so um, tempting to do so, that um, it's very difficult for people to say, I could copy this, but I'm not going to because it's wrong. Nonetheless, a civilization is a institution where people don't do things even if they could get away with them. Uh, whether it's not paying taxes, which we're seeing the cost of in Italy and Greece and so on, or passing off work of others as if it's your own. Uh, in a civilized society, we don't do this kind of thing. And um, I want to avoid sounding like a total curmudgeon, but uh, a motive for writing about it about truth, beauty, and goodness reframed is because because I think it's very difficult for people to think about those concepts in the digital era, in an era of relativism where nobody wants to pass judgment on anything else. And yet, if we don't do that, we're not, a civil, we're not civilized anymore. We're just brutes. And uh, I don't want you to live in a world of brutes, and I don't want uh, my grandchildren, which uh, we hope you will contribute to, uh, to live in that kind of world. And somebody needs to speak up, and maybe that's something that I've earned a certain right to do. Well, and that actually, I mean, you did sort of skip ahead to the truth, beauty, goodness um, conversation, but it actually speaks to the book that came out in the mid-2000s, which is really Five Minds, and you're saying Five Minds for the Future, and you're saying in Five Minds for the Future that there's five different kinds of minds, disciplinary, synthesizing, creating, respectful, and ethical, but it seems you've take a, taken a, a very much a real interest in the respectful and ethical um, sort of in the work you've done in the last few years. And I'm curious if you think, you know, because of new digital media, these, th these have added value and added importance in, when we're thinking about different kinds of minds that we need for the future. Because I'm sure when you wrote Five Minds, you, you broke down your perception of the future, the different ways people need to um, exist. But do you think that there's now a hierarchy in some way in what we need to be doing in, in schools as institutions? OK. Um, sometimes people ask me, a version of the question you just did, namely, are these all equally important, are they all required, or are some of them more important than others? Um, and I guess I would give the following answer. Um, I think the first three, which are more cognitive, uh, are something that we'd like everybody to have, but people are going to specialize. Some people are going to be more disciplined, meaning they're really doing things according to the book, they become experts. But they're not particularly interested in being creative. Some people, and I think this is my special gift, are good synthesizers. They bring lots of stuff together, and perhaps in ways that others haven't. And some people are very creative. They come up with new kinds of things that nobody's thought of before. And so I think that division of labor is going to happen, and that's fine. I wouldn't want to live in a world where everybody was creative. I think we'd go crazy. Um, on the other hand, I wouldn't want to live in a world uh, where people are totally disciplined, but nobody can synthesize or be creative. When it comes to the last two minds, these are not options. These are necessities. Um, the big distinction between respective and respectful and ethical is one that I alluded to a few minutes ago. Respect is how we treat people who are around us. So it's the neighborly version. And I think we need to respect the people whom we see every day, um, whether they are peers or people who have more or less authority than we do, whether they are individuals who we approve of in every particular or those who don't. But respect is really starts very early in life, and it has to do with how folks treat one another. Um, ethics is more complicated. And despite the fact I've been writing about it for many years, I still don't have a very neat way of, of, of conveying it. But basically, when you think ethically, you don't think of yourself as Howard or Andrew. You think of yourself as a worker and as a citizen. Um, so as a worker, I'm a teacher, I'm a writer, I'm a, um, a researcher. And as a citizen, I'm a citizen of my university, of my country, and of course, increasingly of the world. Um, you know, I'm a citizen of the world because if I drive a gas guzzler, I'm contributing to climate um, warming. 
global warming. If I have a bad disease and I get on an airplane and fly somewhere else, I'm being a bad citizen because I'm conveying disease which would not, <coughs> not have been possible in a pre-airplane era. Um, but you know, f five-year-olds cannot think of themselves in terms of roles like worker and citizen. That's something that becomes easier for us as we can think more abstractly. So when you become an adolescent or a tween or a teen, you can think of yourself as a, a journalist or as a future journalist. You can think of yourself as a citizen of your community, as somebody who's going to vote soon. And it's uh, Americans are great for saying what our rights are, and rights are important. And it's nice that professionals have rights, it's nice that citizens have rights, but what I'm interested in when I talk about ethics, are what, what are responsibilities, what are our obligations? You're a teacher, you're a superintendent, you're an architect, um, you are a, a, a musician, you are a, um, a physician or a nurse or a social worker. You ought to have rights, but what are your obligations? What are your responsibilities? And if you don't think about that, if you only think about me, 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 and what I can have, you don't deserve to be considered ethical. Now, as I, as I said earlier, ethical dilemmas are not easy to solve. If they were, we wouldn't call them dilemmas. And I think particularly with new roles, you know, new kinds of work, and with new citizenship demands, being a citizen of the planet, not just of your own little neighborhood, there are lots of things which arise which it's not clear what the right answer is. And so I recommend in the book, and I'm now working on this as much as I can, that we need to create what I call commonses or common spaces, where people who are in the same profession, like education or the same institution, like a college or a secondary school, can talk about the ethical issues which come up literally every day, what they've done, what they think worked, what didn't work, how we might do it better. I mean, let me just mention my own university has been in the news recently for two things. At Harvard last week, 70 kids walked out of an economics lecture because they thought the lecturer was giving a one-sided view of the American economy. You know, is that right? Should students walk out? If not, what should they do? What should the professor's reaction be? We also have at Harvard an Occupy Harvard contingent in the Harvard Yard. And uh, they have tents up there, and they have signs. And the question is, you know, what are they protesting about? Are they protesting it in the right way? What's the obligation of the university to the neighborhood? Nobody's allowed to go through Harvard Yard now unless they have a card. Is that right? And again, there's no right answer to these things. But the more people talk about, reflect on them, give their own views, listen to other people, say, you know, I thought this, but you convinced me. Otherwise, that's what a common space is. And uh, we'll leave it for extra credit uh, when Andrew has changed my mind or vice versa. But that's what a commons view is, is listening to other people whom you respect and trying to learn from them, and that's what you need to create an ethical landscape in any institution. Well, um, defi definitely thinking a lot about that in my new job as an as a educator, community manager for, for a company, BrainPop, um, and I think one of the things that, that is a challenge in, in the new digital media world is that simultaneously the ease of which you can um, share and connect with people um, can, can quickly amplify a certain idea, but it also creates a lot of noise. Um, so there's that, that dichotomy which can be um, challenging in terms of trying to connect with people. There's also a lot of competition, and that's why, as I said so much in the beginning of this, um, this talk today, how much I respect Lucy who is, uh, and Steve, both of whom have really made it their lives work to bring together people from around the world to talk about um, the state of education. Um, and I think this, 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 this conference that we're, we're a part of today is actually a pretty good exemplar of a way of bringing together the people to share and, um, and to um, debate ideas. The, the, the complicated part is how much, how much is there debate and how much is there consensus? Is this, a, is this an echo chamber where we all kind of agree and we're all talking to one another um, and we, it resonates very well and we all Losing feel good about it, but we're not speaking to people that may believe um, differently. And uh, that's, that, I think that's a task. Um, the, uh, the mic does right, go well, I, th I think that um, 
Yeah. I, I mean, you know, t two years ago, um, the Tea Party emerged, and the, the Tea Party was a critique of American society, uh, probably not one that appealed to too many people who are involved. But then Occupy Wall Street arose, and Hi, um, yeah. You get there, Howard? I'm neither hearing nor now I'm here. That's the first I heard in the last minute. Okay, yeah, we're we're listening to yeah, you. I'm you started I, and you stopped. I think your headphones have popped out. No, I don't think so. Um, All right, here's this. Is this better? We hear you. Yeah, we okay. hear you. <laughs> okay, no, I, I was just saying that, um, that both the, yeah. the yeah both the the Tea Party on the right and Occupy Wall Street on the left are what happens when large segments of the population feel that their concerns are not being addressed, and um, that's you know that's the antidote to the echo chamber with people who listen only to people who are just like them. And in a democracy, it's very important that we have these um, these outlets. But as is being epitomized in Washington today, if you just have you know two conversations, let's say Tea Party and Occupy Wall Street, or the Republican caucus and the Democratic caucus, that's not a conversation. And knowing how to facilitate those conversations as, as Andrew was saying, is, is very difficult because people have, um, you know, we have a my way or the highway attitude, which is very, very anti-communitarian. Mm -hmm. For sure. So um, we're running out of time, Dad, and um, I do want to give people an opportunity to ask questions for a couple of minutes because um, it's 2.55 and we have until about 3 o'clock. So um, what I'm going to ask is, if people do have a question, you can use the little hand raising icon, and then I'll give you mic privileges. Um, and you can ask the question to Howard. So use that little hand icon that's up in your participants window. And I'll search through to see if I can find anyone that wants to say anything. I heard, I heard it. OK, Anne, um, I'm going to give you privileges. One sec. All right, you've got audio privileges. Go for it. Are you there, Ann? Ann, to turn your microphone on, click on the talk button at the top left. Hello, can you hear me? Yep. Oh, good. Super. Uh, my question is regarding the relationship between the ethical mind and existential intelligence. Does one need a high level of existential intelligence to have an ethical mind? Nice question. I haven't linked those two in my own mind yet. And my initial thought would be, yes, that's a good proposal. Um, existential means being concerned with very big questions. And certainly ethical is being concerned with very big questions. I guess the only thing I would add is, uh, in the end, ethics is about what you actually do. Um, and you could have a lot of existential intelligence, but not necessarily behave in an ethical way. But I like that, I like that combination. Thank you. Thanks, Anne. Um, you can turn your mic off now. I may actually turn off your computer. Um, is there anyone else with a question um, for Dr. Gardner, a.k.a. Howard, a.k.a. my dad? Looks like Priya. Um, I'm going to give you privileges, Priya. All right, just click the talk button, and we can hear you. We should be able to hear you. Hi there. Um, I really enjoyed listening to you. I'm wondering if you have any thoughts for doctorate students who are thinking about um, the intersection between cognition and learning technologies 
Um, any thoughts on like critical research questions or areas that need to be explored a little bit more? Well, two quick thoughts. I think one always needs to start with what do you want to teach and why, and why is it important, and only then do you say, well, can technology be helpful? Uh, there's nothing worse than saying we've got this new neck technology and now we have to use it. That, that, that's not sensible. The other thing which I'm personally very interested in is we now have the potential for the first time in human history of really individualizing teaching. Because anybody who has access to a computer or a smartphone, we can present things in all sorts of different ways to that person, and we can give that person many different ways of showing what he or she learns or understanding. And this is the way multiple intelligences can really be used to provide an individualized education for everybody. And there's a lot of talk about this, including by me, but there's been very little study of this. And some of the research on learning styles has been disappointing. Again, I'm not a learning styles person, but I think we need to be able to show that knowledge about effective ways of presenting and effective ways of assessing can really make access to knowledge much more democratic and much more universal until it's been by now. Um, nobody anticipated the enormous success of the Khan Academy, and I think that's fantastic, but that's certainly not the only way to learn about gravity or evolution or about the Crimean War. But, but we are living in an interesting time where there is a lot of innovation and at least inquiry and thought going into trying to create individualized learning environments. Um, and I'm sure the, the collective brain intelligence, not to use a um, problematic word, um, in this chat room and in this uh, session probably has a lot, of, a lot to share about different kinds of initiatives that are taking place. And a lot of that work is actually being done in the US too, which is interesting. Um, and a lot of it's in the private sector, um, which is opening up whole other can of worms. So I have one final question to ask you, Andrew. When you went um, to work for Brain Pop, for one more question, did you ever um, and then we should wrap up. So if there is another question, um, Andrew, it's Steve. By using the hand icon at the top of your window, and I'll give you privileges. Andrew, I'm so sorry, it's Steve, but we don't have time for one more question because we have another keynote starting in <laughs> seconds. So we'll let your dad. But he asked, he wanted to ask you a final question, so we'll let him do that, and then we'll wrap. Yeah, it was just it was just a tease, Andrew. When you when you joined Brain Pop, did you ever realize that Pop was me? <laughs> Pretty good one, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great way to corny finish. jokes. <laughs> right. Hey, if, Steve, yeah. if you hover over the smiley face icon, there is an applause link. I've I've seen so many appreciative comments in the chat. Thank you both so much. It is really hard to finish. Uh, on time, but we really appreciate both of your being here. Thanks so well, much. It's been a pleasure. Here, so yes, thank you. And I, I enjoyed looking at the comments, but I couldn't type to them, unfortunately. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, I hope everyone continues to enjoy the conference. This has been a pleasure for me. Um, thanks to you all for attending, and um, best of luck. I'll talk to you later, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> Goodbye, everybody. Yeah, bye. <clears throat> thanks to everyone. Thanks to Howard. Thanks to Andrew. And thanks to Brain Pop one of the conference sponsors. We really appreciate the support. OK, I'm going to turn the recording off. We'll ask you to uh, leave the room so the recording can process. And then please do consider coming. There's a great keynote right now. Um, uh, and there are other good sessions as well. So thanks, everybody. Take care.